You're listening to TLN Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 18 of the Leafs Nation Radio podcast. We got the crew back here, Scott, Kyle, Michael, Caroline. And boys, how was your weekend? Scott, you're watching All or Nothing. Better late than never, huh? <laughs> yeah, um, the reason why I was waiting a while to watch it uh, is no longer a reason. So I got a Amazon Prime like free month trial. So I was like, sure, let's watch it and grind through a lot of other content as well on there. So yeah, I'm finally watching it only on episode four though so don't spoil the ending for me i won't i promise kyle what's going on you're back in to yes got the uh got the toronto set up again uh not the childhood bedroom and <laughs> sheets and old stuff but no it's uh it's definitely not as exciting but it, it still works but uh yeah good to be uh, back here getting ready for what's hopefully the final semester of school so that is both exciting and nerve-wracking and all of it but uh excited to uh be talking leafs here today awesome you're in the final stretch it's exciting and michael mr mysterious what's up (laughs) i'm feeling a little mysterious myself you know it's funny i've been watching i've been in the spider-man uh like uh hype craze right now watching a lot of spider-man movies playing the spider-man miles morales game i I don't know it's just it's uh just been that's just the kind of mood that i'm in when i really get invested in something i just go all in for like way too short of a time and then all of a sudden i burn out very quickly so (laughs) i should you're in the right podcast and with the right people because Scott <laughs> and Kyle know what they're talking about with Spider-Man. And if there's anyone who can commit to TV or a TV show, it's me. So I understand you, but uh, the, the boys love Spider-Man. I've yet to see a single movie. So you're in the right podcast for sure. There we go. I love it. All right, guys, you want to talk about Leafs land, Kyle? This, yeah, we probably should. Okay. So we got two games this week. So I think that's, you know, a celebration in itself these days with the, obviously everything that's going on. <laughs> Feels like it. Games. Yeah. Uh, Leafs played Edmonton, which for me was exciting. Uh, they beat Edmonton, as we know, for two goals by, uh, Tavares Kerfoot, TJ Brody and Ilya Mikheyev. We were super pumped to see Brody and Mikheyev back on the score sheet. And then the Oilers and Avs 5-4 overtime loss to the Avs goals by two from Austin Matthews, Kerfoot and Nick Ritchie, who we'll get to a little bit later in our show right now. Since we we talked about him in last week's episode, Ilya Mikheyev, we spoke to the to the fact that he's seeming to get his confidence here uh, in the season. And I mean, maybe a player that a few weeks ago, not a lot of people knew about even how to pronounce his name. And now he has three goals, one assist in four games. Uh, that confidence continues. He added another goal against the Edmonton, against the Edmonton Oilers and then assist against the Avs. And he seems to be getting pretty comfortable with his role on the ice for the Leafs, which is super good for the Leafs and also a very encouraging sign for him himself. Yeah, he, he plays an important role for the Leafs and being that kind of third line guy who can really drive uh, drive possession from the defensive zone up into the offensive zone. Mm-hmm. And uh, on Saturday, we saw him up in the top six and still looked pretty good alongside uh, Tavares and Nylander there, uh, getting bumped up with some of the COVID protocol stuff that the Leafs were working through. But for Mikheyev, yeah, it's been great to see him start the year this hot because I, I think there was a lot of negative sentiment around him after last year with all the missed chances and then the trade request over the summer and all these kind of things. But um, again, it goes back to the fact that if a player is starting in the defensive zone and it's ending with a missed offensive chance, that's a hell of a lot better than starting in the defensive zone and allowing chance after chance in your own zone. So even if he isn't scoring, there's a lot of value in just getting out of the defensive zone, getting offensive zone starts and having the big guys come out there and get on the ice, which is kind of the whole reason why the third line is there in the first place. Any goals that they get is just kind of a bonus. So it's been great to see him start with this kind of confidence, get the offense rolling early because uh, he's a player that what before his wrist injury, uh, when he was with the team in 2019, he looked like somebody who could score at a fringe second line rate when he was with the team. Then the wrist injury happened, missed a lot of time, came back and didn't look quite the same player. So if he can get back to his early 2019 form, get the goals going again, that's going to be a big, big boost to this team. Yeah. We talk about confidence and as Kyle mentioned as well, just getting those goals early on is a lot better for his headspace than going 20, 30 games with only getting two or three goals. So I think just getting that early start is going to be so huge for him this season. Even if he doesn't always score and still has those like little stretches, it's going to look a lot less bad 
then there's not going to um, be that zero for 14 games, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Better to be three for 14 games than zero <laughs> for 14 games. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he's got his confidence early on. And for now it seems to have turned him into a better version of himself. And you can see that on the ice. Um, I actually didn't think he gelled with Tavares and Nylander in the Colorado game as well as you did, Kyle. But like, I'm also not surprised because that line really didn't work together well last season as as well. Like, I would rather have Kerfoot there. Um, oh, yeah. But also yeah. Kerfoot did a very good job on the top line, so I have no complaints there as well. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good things to like about uh, Ilya Mikheyev's game to start this season. Obviously, there's the question mark of whether or not he'll be able to stay uh, beyond this season because, of course, the trade request talk from uh, the start of last season and now uh, his contract is expiring at season's end. And while I do understand the Leafs have a lot of value in him and I and seeing how his start has been super productive, like there's no question about it. Um, like this might just be the last time we see uh, Ilya Mikheyev as a Leaf. Like once the season ends, there's a pretty good chance he's going to want to go somewhere else. Uh, unless, of course, uh, uh, his agent and Kyle Dubas is able to like uh, work some amends out and able to get him to stick around. But you know what? Like having some pr- production out of Ilya Mikheyev is going to go a long way for the rest of the season. So Obviously, that's tough for, for, for the offseason. That's uh, ways, ways away for, 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 from now. But in the time being, watching him get confident, just improving his game, and just p- providing that secondary scoring that the Leafs could desperately use yeah. uh, as the season goes along, it's great. I totally agree, guys. What is one of your what, what is one of the biggest criticisms that McKay have fa- faced in the past that he is currently approved upon at this point in time in the season, in your opinion? Is it goal scoring? Yeah, it's the finishing because all last season we'd see it time and time again where we'd see the burst of speed, he'd beat a defender, he'd get in close um, and either he'd shoot and and it would go wide or it would be saved or it would be a two on one and he would miss the open net and things like that. Like what it was even in like game five or game six, whatever game it was uh, in the playoff series against Montreal, where he had an opportunity to score in like the dying seconds uh, and whiffed on it. So um, it, it was the uh, in close scoring chances that he would get. It seemed like he would get two or three and then breakaways galore. Um, and then just seemed like he just couldn't convert on any of them last season. Um, and obviously it's early this year, um, but when he's gotten those chances in open space, uh, whether it's been his shot on the power play, which even looked good on the second unit or just that five on five, getting those chances in close. Um, so far this season through the three or four games that he's been in, uh, he looks like a more confident and improved player in that area. Yeah, pretty much the same thing that Kyle said. Like it's, Not being paced. <laughs> yeah, although uh, I'd also with like to add with Michael mentioning his contract um, to uh, specific media conglomerates out there, <laughs> it's been four games. We don't need to talk about his contract yet. <laughs> No. And we also know that he wasn't exactly happy with his role here. He's got a similar role this year. Like it's very unlikely that he's going to resign for any number that makes sense for Toronto. So it's not even like worth going into and discussing whether they can afford him, blah, blah, blah. He's probably gone. They have a replacement in house in Pierre Engvall who provides similar value. So I don't know. It's not really something that's worth our time or effort this early in the season. Absolutely. And the good thing is, though, that uh, there's plenty of options in the system uh, Like guys like Nick Robertson could step up uh, if he stays healthy, of course. <laughs> but uh, that's obviously something to, to not worry about uh, just yet. So for the time being, I'll just enjoy Ilya Mikheyev uh, improving his confidence uh, day, day by day, game by game, week by week uh, until uh, his confidence uh, runs dry again. Yeah, I told, oh, hopefully not. <laughs> I, I, I was just about to say, yeah, like we just need to enjoy the moment and just chill. Yeah. Enjoy the moment, everyone. All right, let's talk about Jack Campbell, who I always love talking about. Great game in Edmonton, 28 saves on the night. And I'm so curious what uh, to hear what you guys think about this. Did he have a great save on Ryan McLeod or did Ryan McLeod have the greatest misplay of the season so far? I have my take. I would love to hear your guys' take. I, th- I think he just whiffed on it, right? Yeah. Like. <laughs> It, like it, Campbell had like the fun, like back diving, getting back in a yeah. position kind of thing, which he kind of does a little too much for my liking. But if he makes a save, he makes a save. Um, but I feel like that was uh, that was the player just kind of not realizing the situation or not realizing the goalie was out of position or something, because um, there's no way that like 
anyone who knows who's cognizant of the situation would try to send that back across the crease right it was it was so funny because like so many tweets were like save of the year and as much as i love jack <laughs> ample i'm no. like that was just like a glorious no. leg extension that just happened to be to be he was in the right spot he could have right been spot. on the bench and that wasn't going in brian so. mcleod honest to god made him look great uh and that's no you know diss or or um i i think ryan mcleod's been doing a really good job for the oilers lately so i i'm not saying i just think that ryan mcleod has been probably losing sleep these last <laughs> oh yeah days, wishing he could get that moment back but nothing against jack campbell he's i think in my opinion right now toronto's mvp but <laughs> i think it was more so right place right time kind of thing yeah. I can't believe he missed that like uh how, how do you miss a wide open <laughs> Like, let's, let's put it this way. Like, if Connor McDavid was playing in that game and he was the one taking the shot, chances are that puck's going in. Like, there's no there's no explanation. There's no uh, excuse to to miss a wide-open net like that because it could have easily have turned the game around. In exactly. Is, with momentum on their side, no less. And that, that's how you lose momentum and kill it in at, like, whatever you had left. So, like, credit to Jack Campbell. Like, he put his leg in the right position at the right time, even though he wasn't, like, really looking at it. Like, he was falling down, maybe wasn't even looking at the play. But, uh, hey, if it's a save, it's a save. As I always say, there are goalies in the NHL who make saves, and there are goalies who just happen to be in the way of the puck at the right time. <laughs> and sometimes they cross over, and that was a time where Campbell just happened to be in the right place at the right time to get in the way of the puck. <laughs> It's uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys know the drama here in Edmonton, uh, but Dave Tippett at the end of one of the games said that the reason they lost was because Koskinen kind of threw Koskinen under the bus. Then the next day Koskinen comes to the media saying, you know, he he hasn't had much help from goal scoring. So he kind of threw his teammates under the bus. I don't know. It's this like vicious toxic cycle here in Edmonton. But after that moment, people were tweeting and I loved it because they're like, maybe Koskinen has a point when you have someone like Ryan McLeod, who has the ability to exactly what Michael said, change the momentum in the game and absolutely does not finish a wide open net. Again, I don't want to, you know, come down on Ryan McLeod. These things happen. I can't tell you how many times in a game I have whiffed a ball <laughs> in front of the net. And that to me is one of the most embarrassing things. Cause not only do you miss the net, oh, you yeah. basically almost tear your hamstring because you're ready to put like this ball to space and you miss, you miss the ball completely and you end up falling because your, your foot hits your other foot. So I'm sure Ryan McLeod would love to have that moment back, but goal scoring an issue in Edmonton, he made Jack Campbell look really, really better than he was in that moment. Uh, but it's just interesting to hear what hockey fans have to say and how they go back and forth online. But I don't think there's any argument about his save on Taves against the Avs. That was a Superman yeah. dive across the crease. That guy just absolutely came out of nowhere. And I think the cherry on top was just what I love about Jack Campbell is not only is he as good as he is MVP Toronto, but whatnot and should be in the conversation for the Vesna. It's like his reaction after we don't get that from a lot of NHLers, his smile ear to ear. Uh, you can you know, see it. Yeah. You can see it. And I'm like, what a, it's so nice for Leafs fans to not constantly live in this, like, <laughs> space of negativity that when you see someone like Jack Campbell do something like that, like you can't help, but just like want to give him an absolute high five through the TV. Or if you're watching in person, just which no one is these days, uh, you know, just, it's just awesome. What he, what he's doing is awesome. What do you guys think about that save? Oh, it was ridiculous. It was so, so good. Um, and, and yeah, the, the game itself was just kind of chaotic throughout, but um, like Jack Campbell is just like so good and like so so nice and like welcoming and stuff like that that even in a market like Toronto we just ignore the current contract situation we're like oh yeah that's probably going to be something we got to deal with but we'll, we'll, we'll put that uh, we'll put that to the side because we're enjoying this right now and just like at like three games in a Mikheyev scoring a couple goals and we've already got articles like that and blah 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 and Jack Campbell we're just like nah we'll we'll put that to the side he's too nice we want to enjoy this he's the I going into the abs game because I've been doing my series now with uh, the Leafs nation where I do a breakdown of the other team and see where there are matchups that the Leafs can exploit. Um, previewing the abs game, I realized that especially without Marner and two thirds of their shutdown line, there is pretty much no way that they would be able to exploit the abs at five on five. <laughs> In fact, it was like, Yep. <laughs> the, the best case scenario was um, Samuel Gerrard is having a bad season defensively. So like maybe take advantage of that. Um, but like I um, basically the only way the Leafs could have won that game is 
that they had the advantage in goaltending and special teams. And both of those aspects were really good for the Leafs. It's just another factor uh, where's black and white stripes got in the way and uh, <laughs> basically gave the abs four times the power plays that the Leafs had. And there's no way that that's like, that's going to affect the game as well. I, I love that you bring that up because you look at the scoreline, you, you see five goals and you think, okay, Jack Campbell must have not been on his game, but I actually think he had a really good game. And if it was anyone else, but Jack Campbell probably would be an even bigger scoreline, but uh, the abs are fu- I've just put the abs are stacked. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I thank God I got that. The abs are stacked. And, and yeah, the, that was the game for the Leafs when I saw. So it was funny. I, I tuned into the game. I see three, nothing. I'm like, Whoa, okay, nice. And then as we know, it never, the three, nothing, the four ones, it never holds up for us. Um, it's, yeah. It's, I, I'm not even bothered by that. Like, no, lead. like I'll it, take a it, point. It, it happens so much that it's just comical at this point anyways, but like it in particular, that game, we shouldn't have been up four to one. So yeah. it's the fact that we got out of there with a point considering the state of our roster right we'll now, I'm going to take it we'll compared take to it. the Fs. There are other teams that we could have a depleted lineup against and run them into the ground. You know, we got Arizona on Wednesday. That shouldn't be a problem, but <laughs> knock on wood. Right? Yeah. I'll just knock whatever. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I agree with Scott that uh, after that game, like as bad as it was to blow a 4-1 lead, because like obviously who wants to see the Leafs blow another 4-1 lead uh, against any team? Like the fact that they even uh, were able to get up 4-1 in the first place is a miracle. And the fact they even got a point to begin with is because of Jack Campbell and Jack Campbell alone. Like making 44 saves on 49 shots against, like, that's absolutely ridiculous. And the Leafs were clearly like, they looked tired by, by, by the third period. And had Jack Campbell not stood on his head, if Peter Morazic was playing in that game, let's just put it in that perspective, I don't think the Leafs would be even get a point. They'd probably lose like eight to eight to four or something like that. But yeah, Jack Campbell was the star of that game. I won't get into the the power the power of play uh, discrepancy because uh, that's already been discussed to death uh, the last few days. But um, yeah, no, I'm I'm loving what I'm loving Jack Campbell. I would I would love for him to stay as a lead. He's the MVP for this year. Vesna Trophy definitely. Uh, what's our Rosh Trophy? Maybe, maybe ah, just sprinkle everything in there. Hey, and we got an Alex Kerfoot revenge goal. So basically that's a win. Okay. Perfect segue. Let's talk about him. Unreal year, unreal week for, for Alexander Kerfoot picked up five points this week, two goals and three assists. And uh, Joseph Zita on the leafsnation.com uh, wrote that Kerfoot has 24 points, six goals, 18 assists in 33 games this season, which means he's on pace to finish the season with 60 points. That would be a career year for Kerfoot at this point in time. Do we think he can do it? I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit. He, oh, he's been, yeah, I like he's, it. He's been good this year, um, and, and I really like him in that second-line role. Um, it's something that I've actually been advocating for Kerfoot to be in for a couple of years now. Um, he, they tried to shoehorn him into that third-line center defensive kind of shutdown role, and it just didn't work. He isn't the play driver that you really need to uh, kind of drive a third line the, the way that they were hoping for this year with the addition of David Kampf. It frees him up to move back to the wing, which is his stronger, better position. Um, and he's better as a complementary piece in the top six. And we've seen it this year with the success he's been having with Tavares and Nylander. We've seen it in the past in small samples, but this year we've seen it over the course of the full season. And he's looking like the three and a half million dollar player or thereabouts, which he um, is on the salary cap. So the, the one thing that I will say, though, is that he's been getting a lot of shooting luck when he's on the ice right now. His PDO is very high at like a 106 individually right now. Um, his goals for is a lot higher than what his expected goals for would be um, in terms of a defensive role and things like that. So while it's been great so far this season, and I think the offense might continue, um, I, I, there is going to be some regression involved here. So uh, it's been great recently as well with him stepping up to the first line with Marner out and then looking good in that role over the weekend. But um, don't expect over the course of the full season from Kerfoot. Enjoy it while it's here, but there is going to be some regression. Yeah, funny that you talk about shooting percentage. I was also looking into that uh, to prepare for the podcast today. And he actually leads the uh, team in on-ice shooting percentage. So not only is it just like him self getting luck with shooting, it's everyone he plays with has been doing, like getting a lot of shooting luck this year. I mean, like maybe that's just because he's been playing with uh, some really good players for most of the year. So like there could be something to that as well. 
but um yeah and even like you look at his uh regularized adjusted plus minus with yeah i was gonna that, mention it yeah with, <laughs> it's, to those that's really to those, funny to look at <laughs> to those that don't know it's basically a stat that evolve or a model that evolving hockey that is, has come up with that basically isolates your stats to get rid of stuff like arena bias um quality of competition quality of teammates and uh kerfoot has a very high blue bar for his goals for which basically just indicates luck if you look at the fact that the other four for like Coursey for Coursey <laughs> yeah. for expected goals for Coursey against expected goals against are basically on the zero, like the replacement line. Yeah. He's, so, he's like in like the 99th percentile or something in goals for this season. Yeah. And then in expected goals for it's like, it's been like slightly above average, which is something you'll take from him. But uh, yeah. yeah, there it, it, he's been getting quite the shooting luck recently, which it, to be fair, if you look over the last couple of years, he was probably in store for. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's going to come back down to earth at some point, but uh, the Leafs will enjoy it while it's happening. Yeah. And you know what? I agree with you guys. Uh, we were talking about this with Jack Campbell when he had like super, exactly. super high numbers. It's just normal and yeah. human to come down. Uh, I just love to see players like Kerfoot have the potential to have a career year because that's big. That's big for a player. Yeah. Uh, and maybe not in the scheme of comparing them to the league's top players, but for him individually, you know that he gets to go home after a game and saying and say to himself, I'm having a really, really good season uh, individually. And I think that that's awesome for Kerfoot. And, and players like Ilya Mikheyev, if he can continue. Be, for me, consistency is everything. So if Kerfoot can consistently uh, do what he's doing, if Ilya Mikheyev can do it at a consistent level, I think that you know it's worth mentioning in terms of their individual performances. Nothing else. It just solidifies that the Leafs did make a good decision in bringing him in uh, in exchange for Nazem Kadri, which obviously is probably one of the most controversial discussions. I know. I'm so sad about Kadri till this day. Yeah. And like, obviously, like his production is nowhere near close to Kadri's right now because Kadri is leading the abs and scoring with 44 points at the time of this recording. So like it's apples to oranges at this point um, in terms of like how Kerfoot season is going versus how Kadri season is going. But it's been nice to see people's opinions on Kerfoot slowly turn around. Like from what, at the start, there's like, oh, he's not Kadri. He's not playing like Kadri. And why did we trade for him kind of thing? And now he's just he's slowly but surely becoming a, his own kind of this kind of player who's providing value to the team and being one of the key secondary scores. Like it's been good to see him have the success that he's been, uh, I think he's been like missing since uh, he's come to Toronto because he's had two good seasons to start his career in Colorado and then a down year to start. And then I get a decent season last year, but this year looks like he could reach career numbers, which, which would be awesome to see. So I think it's, it's, a, it's been a long time coming for Kerfoot. Yeah. He's already passed his point totals from last year. Mm -hmm. So Exactly. I think the Quaker Leafs fans realize no one will replace Kadri, the, the better the healing process will be. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Nick Ritchie, which I was super excited to. I almost saved the best topic for last. <laughs> Put on waivers after Toronto versus Edmonton. He was hot off the waiver wire, okay? Played against the Avs, scored a big goal, Got a very unnecessary penalty, ultimately changed the game. It's so funny. I was like, I believe it was even Nick Richard who tweeted like, so happy. I don't, I don't want to quote him, but he was like, so happy for Richie. And then he was like, hold on. I take that back. Like literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what a disastrous like series of events. And oh. I mean, at this point in time, I feel like he's been given so many opportunities to showcase himself and what he can do for this team. He hasn't necessarily lived up to those expectations, to put it nicely. Um, what will happen to Nick Ritchie moving forward? That's the question. Um, <laughs> is he going to get traded? Is he going to go down to the Marlies when they get a fully healthy forward lineup? Um, there's a lot of options here. Um, in terms of that game, it was so frustrating because he gets the big goal on the power play, which for starters, a Nick Ritchie goal with a Wayne Simmons primary <laughs> assist. I feel like we should be scared for what's going to happen next year. But <laughs> um, but no, for, for Ritchie, he, he, it seemed like the being placed on waivers kind of lit a fire under him a little bit. We saw him be a little bit more physical. We saw him rough it up a little bit more. Something that we've not seen from him at all this season to the extent that you would hope for yeah. for a player of his stature and with the pay grade he's getting being demoted down the lineup and things. Um, he hasn't been as physical as maybe you would expect him to be. And so seeing him be a little bit more physical, get the big goal, everything was trending towards him, maybe having another nice stretch here, getting into a couple of games, 
And then he just takes a cross-checking interference penalty for no good reason with a couple minutes to go. Instead of being able to attack in the last couple minutes, they're defending. Then you go to overtime. And with the two teams being the way they are and the Leafs having one of their top overtime guys, Mitch Marner being out as well, um, you could probably see the way that it was going to end up going in overtime there as well. And so for Richie, it's just, it seems like any time a little bit of positive momentum happens, it's sapped away by a bad penalty or bad this. Um, and so from here, when Angval and Marner do come back from COVID protocol, which I believe should happen uh, before the next game as well, um, does he go just go down to the taxi squad? He sticks around the team. The team saves a million on the cap. They're able to accrue a little bit of space. Or do they decide to do the Alex Galchenyuk route, that kind of thing, where they send him down to the Marlies, put him on the top line and try and figure something out for him, try to get some confidence back and see if they can salvage it? Yeah, it says a lot about his play that um, he could score a goal and fans are still <laughs> pissed at him yeah. after the game is over. Um, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, it's not like it's not earned. Like, that was an insanely dumb penalty to take that late I have no clue what he was thinking. Like, like, that's the kind of penalty I make in Chell when I'm trying to go for the puck <laughs> and I miss. And because I'm holding up on the trigger, yeah. I go for a hit on a yeah. guy that doesn't have it. Um, except he doesn't have that excuse. Um, but, um, yeah, it's like, at this point, I don't really see what kind of role he has with the team. Hopefully he can... You know, like Kyle said, maybe they send him down to the Marlies and make him a bit more of a reclamation project. Um, but yeah, it's just he's we've tried him everywhere. He hasn't really found a place where he really fits. Um, like even on the fourth line, Spezza and Simmons dominate fourth line competition all year, but they don't when Richie's on their line. Yeah. So I think that's pretty telling as well. Um, yeah, I honestly looking back at the off season, I don't know why Dubis gave him the second year to begin with. I guess like maybe that was just market value at the time, but yeah, it's it's weird that a two point five million dollar contract is a tough one for us to get out of. But that's probably not. Um, that I guess that's really all you need to know about Nick Ritchie. Then, if he's that cheap and is still a negative value contract, <laughs> it's been tough to watch him struggle because I know he's got potential to be at least some make some kind of an impact in the middle six. Like, uh, like he was been given every single opportunity to succeed on this team, like uh, starting from playing a bit of top line minutes with Matthews and Marner at the start of the year. And he struggled in that role. I just think he's never really found a permanent spot on the lineup. And like, it's kind of hard to really get confidence when you keep getting yeah. shuffled throughout the lineup and never really stick there for, for more than a couple weeks at a time. Like, obviously, I want to see him succeed because I think, like, when you sp when you commit that kind of money, like, obviously, it doesn't compare to, like, some of the other contracts on the team. But still, $2.5 million isn't nothing. But at the same time, it's like, at some point, you just got to cut loose. And, uh, like, Nick Ritchie, you did your best. Good good try. But uh, time to give someone else an opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think he's played a little – he has some potential to turn this thing around. Like, uh, maybe the uh, waiver – going to put on waivers could be the spark that turned the season around. But once everyone's healthy, I would he'd be the first one that gets scratched. Yeah. I feel for him. I'm never one to like crap on a player, but it's funny. I was seeing Twitter saying Nick Ritchie potentially could go to the Edmonton Oilers. And I'm like, why? Like, why does Edmonton take, you know, I don't, I don't even know how to put this nicely, but why does Edmonton see value in like Toronto's? <laughs> least performing players i think that's as nicely as i can say it and i i had i told mike that and mike's like edmonton will do it you'll see edmonton will do it and i'm like that would just be insane but maybe maybe it's a thing for nick ritchie because again with michael I, I like how you put this kind of in a positive spin you were hoping because you can see that there is potential in nick ritchie but just maybe he hasn't found that cadence with this team and that role uh with this team that he feels confident in. and maybe it just would take another team to get to, but I'm not quite sure based on the opportunities he was given with some of the league's best players. Um, I don't know. I don't know what his deal is. I was expecting way more from him and even more of like an a smart, aggressive play from him that I haven't really seen. So I don't know what to say about Nick Ritchie. There's no feelings in business. I would say, you know, at some point you got to cut the ties and move on. 
The, the difficult thing is that there just isn't really a fit for him on any of the lines right now with yeah. Michael Bunting kind of winning that first line job alongside Matthews and Marner. That was kind of the one spot that you could maybe see Richie working in. The line was solid when he was there, but it's, it's just been much better when Bunting's there. So Bunting has that first line spot and then Kerfoot has the second line spot. And then he's not really a fit on the third line because it's a defensive zone start line who transitions the puck up with speed. And that's basically the opposite of Nick Ritchie's game. He's not a defensive player. He doesn't have speed to bring the puck up. He's a net front player. So he's not a fit there. And then on the fourth line, he's been decent at times. But when Spets is there and Wayne Simmons is there, they need a facilitator to bring the puck up the ice for them, a Pierre Engvall type who can transport the puck up the ice and then get them into the offensive zone. And Nick Ritchie isn't that again. And so when he doesn't end up get winning that top six job and other players are performing better, all of a sudden there isn't a fit on the third line and he's not really a great fit on the fourth line and he's the 13th forward and on waivers. So he was good last year for Boston uh, in kind of a third line role at times. Um, there just hasn't been a fit for the way that the Leafs have wanted it to work out. Um, and now I, I, I just don't see a way that he gets back into the lineup in a meaningful way unless there's injuries. Um, because like I said, I don't see a fit on the third line. I don't see a fit really on the fourth line. Uh, and so unless a bunting or a Kerfoot misses some time, I, I just don't really see where he gets back in the lineup in a meaningful way. David Krejci is one hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Oh my goodness. All right, guys. Well, best of luck to Nick Ritchie with whatever happens. So let's yeah. move on. Leafs. Obviously, you want to see it end up well. And hopefully, either for him, he ends up finding a situation where he can get traded to a team and turns it around, or he turns it around with the Marlies or something, because he's he's a local area kid. He came to Toronto to sign. He's got a bit more of an expensive contract, but especially with the second year there, something's got to happen to try and work this out. Well, that's yeah. the thing, right? Like you, um, I just hope that whatever happens for players is the best for them overall. When Ethan exactly. was traded yeah. from the Oilers to the Hurricanes, I, I, you know, I wasn't happy with that. But now you look at Ethan and even Freddie Anderson, who's with Carolina, yep. and yep. You, you see them killing it on a team overall that's killing it. So you can't be anything but happy for them. Um, so sometimes that's just maybe he's having a little bit of a shitty run here in Toronto and something, maybe it is Edmonton, who knows? And, and he excels on another team. Sometimes that's just the way it goes. So you'd hope that whatever is just best for Richie happens. And if that's with Toronto or not, then that's the way she goes. That's sports, right? Yeah, like I, I hope that Nick Ritchie scores forty goals with the Leafs, but like I <laughs> yeah, also exactly. realize Everyone that. Would love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, like, but like I realize that that's not super likely, and the way he's playing, that's even less likely. So I'm just gonna call it as it is and say he hasn't been performing well. I love Ritchie. I want him to way do well, but on he the other, isn't. everyone can coexist and be happy. And no, uh, um, I think it was um, Brendan Perlini who scored for the Oilers against the Leafs. And I think that might have been his second goal all season. And people were tweeting, he's going to be on the 2024 NHL All-Star team. I just love like the hopeful <laughs> hockey fans out there who get like, just a, they get a little bit and they run with it. It makes my day. So I also completely never forgot Brandon <laughs> Perlini was back in the league and with Edmonton too. I completely forgot about oh that. Oh my God. Yeah, it's good times. It's, it's, it's really good times. I mean, when you play on a team with McDavid, anyone in theory is potential All-Star <laughs> uh, game material because you just have to strap him to him and they'll probably score 40 goals. So... <laughs> He's so good. He's, it's so unfortunate he's on COVID-19 protocol, as everyone is these days, especially here in Edmonton. But the Leafs right now are in Vegas. There's a little bit update. Uh, what's going on in Vegas? So this morning, Jack Campbell and Matthews are out on maintenance. Maintenance day is super important. Matthews had a big game against the Avs, two goals. And then Andre Kasha skated this morning. So that's some positive news for Leafs fans. Golden Knights are coming off of a 2-1 loss to the Blackhawks. So we obviously know that they'll want a nice W on home ice. And the Leafs and the Golden Knights play tomorrow. What is it, 8 p.m. Eastern time? 10 p.m. I think so. That sounds about right. 10 p.m. Eastern time. 10 p.m. Eastern. Maybe I'm seeing, in, I'm seeing it in mountain time uh, on, on my schedule. All right, cool. So friggin' Westerners. <laughs> I know, we suck. At least it's getting warmer here. Thank God. We're out of like the minus. Yeah, it was pretty two. bad there for a bit. Whole, I don't think you guys understand. I'm like, no, my we, God. we don't. We don't. It was. I would check the Toronto weather and it's like two degrees. And I'm like, wow, yeah. my goodness, that what I would do to, to go and walk my dog in two degree weather, which <laughs> I never thought I would say, cause I hate winter overall. And I still think two degrees is cold. Um, but yeah, minus 40 has changed my life. 
I'd have to say. But do we think the boys can get it done in Vegas? Uh, can they can they bounce back from this loss against the Avs, which we said isn't the worst loss in the world, and and find a way to come out with a win? Yeah, like I forget who mentioned it earlier, but I think it might have been Michael where the the Leafs kind of started to look tired as that Colorado game went along. And you can kind of expect that when you look at how few games they've played, how quick of a pace they had to match against Colorado, you can and missing a couple of players, you can kind of see where things kind of fell off the rails as the game went along here. So it's going to be a tough week, uh, a road trip. Uh, Obviously, it's going to be a fun one for Austin Matthews going back home and things like that. Um, I did see earlier today that Arizona skipped practice and stuff like that. So there might be something there with the game for Wednesday, but assuming that does go ahead, um, it's going to be a back-to-back for the first time. And I don't know how long. So we'll see Peter Morazic back in action, which is exciting to see because he's had his own injury concerns and getting him back and rolling is going to be a big part down the stretch here to take some of the load off of Jack Campbell. But uh, it's going to be a fun game against Vegas. They've got a lot of fun players on their team. Yeah. They've got a lot of injuries though, as well. Still a lot of players out. Um, but uh, looking forward to that game because again, that's a team the Leafs haven't played in a long time. Um, and then uh, I think it's three games this week. So slowly building that schedule back up to speed um, yeah. with uh, with the road trip <laughs> this Thank week. God. You actually get the full slate of games rather than being at home and having them all postponed and rearranged and stuff. Le- uh, Leafs fans are lucky because Edmonton right now, we were supposed to play the Sens tonight. It got switched to Saturday. We got one game in the week. It's like. Oh, yeah, that's tough. It's tough for hockey fans. We're it's used it's to tough to, more. even for, for the team though, it's tough to get that rhythm back when you're used to playing three games a week, four games a week, especially this part of the season. And all of a sudden you're playing one, there's like a week in between games. It's, yeah. it's tough to kind of build up that conditioning again and, and get in that rhythm. Especially for these players that are actually battling COVID right now to come back and, and yeah. try and get their their lungs back the the you know their momentum back it's not easy by any means i feel i really i've been saying this to everyone i really feel for all the nhlers across the league with all the uncertainty and adversity they've had to deal with um i think it's kind of been a crazy year for them so i do feel for them yeah thank god for vaccines am i right you'd have to be an <laughs> idiot not to take one of those <laughs> i'm not even starting that conversation on here. i'm scared sometimes to say my opinion here in uh in alberta oh, I, yes. I just keep my mouth shut and, and walk I, I have like this slight hope that like the difference between the red wings making the playoffs or not <laughs> is um the games they lose in canada because one of their best forwards is too stupid to take a vaccine so oh, that he can play those games <laughs> Well, then good I mean, it's good for, we, Bertuzzi, we have a lot. Yeah. It's fun for the meat, not fun. I mean, wrong word. It, it's it's for the media. It's interesting because we have something to talk about, right? Like we could blow that up and have so much fun talking about it. If that were the case, imagine, but health is first and foremost. And I hope that we get to a point where people understand that. And we want to go yeah. back to our, we want to go back to our regular lives where we do get three hockey games a week and everything's normal. But anyway, Vegas. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think as Kyle said uh, there, um, like they also have their fair share of injuries. So I think this should be a little bit of a closer matchup than the one against the Avs, considering that these are two of the best teams in the NHL. Um, it kind of sucks that we can't uh, play them until the Stanley Cup finals, potentially with Eichel in the lineup this season, because I feel like that could be like a fun game between yeah. two of the top teams in the league. Matthews Eichel is always fun. Like that yeah. was always a fun matchup. So, <laughs> well, it wasn't, but that was because Buffalo. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> Seeing them head to head was fun because Matthews was usually doing the winning. Yeah. yeah. It was Matthews just like dummying Eichel and Eichel just like, <laughs> I can't do anything about this. <laughs> like what? There was the goal where he dummied like the goalie and Darlene, I think it was. And yeah, there, there was a lot of fun stuff. Darlene was the goalie. That's how. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Was. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how juked out both players were. They switched positions. Positions uh, midway through the deke. Um, but yeah, like Vegas still finds a way to be a deep team regardless. So it'll be a tough game. Um, I'm glad this is the first one of the two on the back to back. I'd much rather face Arizona on the yeah. second half of the back to back. Um, but also I'm looking at their potential lineups, although this is a couple days old now in daily face off. But um, we may be in the makings for a Ben Hutton revenge tour. <laughs> oh, he's definitely scoring. Oh. Michael, you haven't heard Michael for like five minutes, and now you just hear him laughing in the background. I love it. 
Well, okay, he's going to get an assist at the very least. He's going to get multiple points. <laughs> yeah. Ben Hutton, right. geez. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Let's end the episode on songs for the week. What do you guys got? Ooh, I got to grab one. All right. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Scott. Oh, so it's kind of funny that I've, like, I keep talking about, like, how I'll make this playlist weird with my music tastes, and I keep then suggesting songs that everyone knows. Um, but <laughs> this week, my jam has been uh, Good For You by Olivia Rodrigo, because nice. I'm a petty motherfucker. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Scott, we're on the same wavelength because guess my song by Driver's License by Olivia Rodrigo. <laughs> so here's the thing. I, I I love music, but I hadn't really gotten into her album because unfortunately I kind of was like, she's young. So her music must be like really tailored to like a young audience for, I never listened to her sour album. Okay. And I know I'm late to the party, but I saw on TikTok. Uh, some there's some drama between uh, her and some guy that she apparently wrote the album about and then that's where I was invested I was like I need to listen to every song and of course of course I heard driver's license on the radio here and there but when you take a minute to listen to her lyrics and how well she's written all of these songs it's honest to god from top to bottom like a work of art and she's got a good voice she reminds me almost like of a young Taylor Swift so I'm uh I love her album. I love her. And yeah, I'm uh, I'm obsessed with every single one of her songs. So she has a new fan in me. Yeah. Her her influences are very, very obvious in a lot of her songs. Like yeah, as much as I love going good, for my song as, pick. <laughs> as much as I love good for you, um, it definitely sounds like a, a certain Paramore song that's well known. I am. <laughs> and so, on like, that theme, uh, Misery <laughs> Business will be my song yeah. pick for the week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Um I think my pick will be uh, Memories by Thunt Moose, which was uh, one of the songs in the Into the Spider-Verse soundtrack, which is what I was trying to imply at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it'd be, it's also kind of a good song if you listen to the lyrics. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but uh, Love yeah, it. that's my pick for the week. Yeah, that was a very, very good soundtrack. Like I, I love watching a movie and then going to Spotify and writing like Spider-Man soundtrack and you get all the songs and mm-hmm. something that you typically wouldn't listen to, but I love that. Great choice. Yeah. I, it's as a music fan if a movie can take me away with the soundtrack as well as the like movie itself uh, it's probably a good sign last week um mike and i were talking about movies that we used to watch as kids and then the goofy movie came up i don't know if you guys we might be dating ourselves as really old by saying <laughs> no, I, I watched those movies so, yeah mike was like he's like find me the main song he's like i'll sing every word so we were we went to spotify and we, we typed in goofy movie and of course the entire playlist came came up and we were just going down memory lane it's so fun actually to like search a movie playlist and then think about where, what like year it took you it can take you back to, I think that's, what's really cool about uh, pop culture and movies and music. It's there's like, I, yeah. I swear there's a timestamp on your life with these movies and these songs. So it's really cool. Yeah. Even movies that don't have like a soundtrack based on like, you know, pop songs and stuff like that, yeah. but it's just like a movie score. Like there are sometimes where I'll go back and listen to those and even like have a few, I pull away. Like, I think I've had a couple of times where I'll actually just have a, song that's a movie score from a soundtrack in my top songs list uh this year it was uh at the speed of sound but which is from the uh the uh, schneider cut of justice league nice which is like i don't know if any of you have seen that one but it's like the scene where he uh spoiler alert (laughs) (laughs) freezes time to uh try and erase the fact that the justice league just lost the battle and save them all and like just the music in that song is just like really cool and like really hypes you up as well Love um it. yeah or like portals the song from the portal scene in avengers endgame that's one that always uh just like goosebumps love it kyle i i gave mine it's misery okay. business i'm going the <laughs> i'm going the original olivia rodrigo route nice <laughs> nice okay awesome well that's great we are have we started making our playlist I did. Yeah, I posted yeah. it in the Slack, and I thought I emailed it to you, but I might—you might not have 
I, I can double check. And that. it is absolutely the gong show I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm the worst like slack, <laughs> slack earth. That's funny. Um, I am a slacker when it comes to slack. Um, dad joke, but uh, I'll check it out because today I got a, a good workout plan. So maybe I'll throw that on in the background. <laughs> Oh yeah, this You'll will be, be a very great confused. workout. Plan. This will, it will be confusing. I'll be in the middle of like a heavy dumbbell set, and I'm sure some very depressing song will come on, and I'll be like, "Wait a minute." <laughs> or some Christmas music. Or, oh yeah. Right, I know. Right, yeah. exactly. Why not? Right. I love our playlist. All right, boys. This has been episode 18 of the Loose Nation Radio podcast. We have some games to look forward to this week, which means that we'll have a lot to talk about next Monday. Join us as always, and it's been a pleasure. See ya. Thanks for listening to TLN Radio, a member of the Nation network of podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode.